Welcome to Jimby Live, direct from the ASM Micro Meeting in Washington, D.C. We're really glad to have everyone in the audience here, and we look forward to talking to all of you that will listen to us online. Today, we're going to talk to four of the Karski Award winners for excellence in undergraduate education. And they're going to cover a number of years, each receive the award for different things. There's so many ways you can really achieve excellence in education. And so this is going to be a delight to hear the different stories. And we'll start off with this year's awardee, 2022, Nancy. Hi, my name's Nancy Bory. I'm from Iowa State University and the 2022 Karski Award winner. Thank you. Next, we'll move on to Dave Westenberg. Dave. Hi everyone, my name is Dave Westenberg. I'm at Missouri University of Science and Technology and won the award in 2020. From there, we go to Mark O. Martin. That's right, I'm Mark Martin from the University of Puget Sound in Tacoma, Washington, Karski awardee in 2018. And finally, the 2016 awardee. Hi everyone, I'm Loretta Brancasio Terrace. Uh, I teach at Kingsborough Community College of the City University of New York. So you can see we've got the country covered here. Excellence in education research is all over the map, which is really good for our students. Maybe we could start off. Nancy, it'd be nice to hear, what do you think was the key thing that you got the award for? Um, I, I'm still a little mystified by that, but I, I would guess uh, I built a course on One Health and Pandemics, taught it the first time in fall of 2019. So timing is everything. That sounds great. Dave? Yeah, I, I wish I knew why exactly I got the award. Um, I, I think a lot of it is just necessarily a specific thing, but that's just what motivates me. And I'm motivated by my connections with students and helping students to find those connections and student success. I think that's the other part of the award that's over. It's not just the teaching, but it's inspiring students and motivating them. Yeah, I, I think the success part is part of how we define excellence, right? <laughs> Mark? I, I, it, that's always a hard question to answer, but what I think worked for me are just two things. As an incubator for students going into graduate programs, earning their PhDs, and the intersection between science and art. Yeah, if you have not met Marco Martin, when you meet him, he will give you a 3D printed object or a button that will you'll remember forever. <laughs> Laura? Uh, I think what it was, was working with community college students in, with undergraduate research and in writing intensive courses and assessing that. And then from there, helping a whole bunch of faculty across the country on developing education research projects through ASM. So, so this group here does a couple of things. They, they have tremendous expertise in analysis. So when you think you're successful in doing something in education, how do you really know it's a success? It, it can't just be a gut feeling if you're going to take that on to other people. So that's one of the things, I think. And I think that the other thing is the tremendous enthusiasm that gets students excited to learn, right? And I think we have the whole scale here on the, on the stage today. It would be really interesting to hear a little bit about your career path. How did, how did you get into education research, Nancy? Um. I started teaching uh, many moons ago, uh, but it, the, when you're teaching, like you were saying, you think you're doing well, how do you know you're doing well? And it kind of led really naturally into assessment of how do we really know that the students are doing what we think that they should be doing? And then the other piece is how do we decide what we think they should be doing? So a little bit of both of those kind of led me to the path of education research. How can we best help the students be where they want to be in five years, 10 years, and so on? Opening doors. So Nancy, in addition to your own work, you're part of a network that really promotes this type of analysis across the country. Could you say something about that too? Um, I'm a part of a couple of networks. Uh, the Palm Network, the Promoting Active Learning and Mentoring Network, where we have a bunch of mentors 
that if somebody is interested in education research or interested in having active learning in their classrooms instead of straight lecture, they will hook you up with a mentor and each mentor can have two or three or, or mentees and we meet regularly and talk about education. It's great. Wonderful. So, Dave, the same question for you. How did you get into this? Well, for me, getting into the, the research side of education was really ASM programs. You know, I mean, I, I had been teaching for, for many years and, and, you know, I was successful, I think, you know, student evaluations and things like that. But, you know, that question, are they really learning? And, and ASM had programs like originally the biology scholars then became the, uh, or what was it before? I mean, the biology scholars program and learning how to actually do the assessments and the evaluation and, and learning how to really tell are the students learning the things that I I think they're picking up. Dave, you've worked hard to integrate microbiology into other disciplines as well. Could you say something about that? Oh, absolutely. I'm being at, a, at an engineering school. Um, the thing that I loved is the opportunity to work with colleagues from across the, the campus. And as I tell the students, actually, I don't do any of that. My students do. Um, and, and a good example of that is I had a, a freshman this year working in my lab that is a physics major. And he was doing an honors project in a chemistry class and wanted to do microbiology. So you can't get much better interdisciplinary than that. And that's what I love about our students. I think that's also a really nice thing about microbiology because you can see where it touches everything. And it's also tied to a strategic plan for the ASM over the next five years for the, the American Academy of Microbiology to really focus on climate change and microbes and climate change. And I think there are a lot of people out there who would have no clue how microbes were involved in climate change. We know they really are, so. Loretta, you, have a, you teach at a very different institution, have a really different perspective. How did you get there? So it's interesting, Stanley. Believe it or not, at Kingsborough Community College, there, you have to have publications in order to get tenure and promoted and move through the scales. And also, money's tight. So whatever we do, we want to know, is it working? And we were taking students to ASM's um, Abercams conference, and we wanted to know, were these things really working? We were investing a lot of time. Um, we were developing courses, and we wanted to see if we were making good use of our time. Um, and that led to finding a community of like-minded people outside of City University and Kingsborough. And ASM got me that community. And to give back to all that was given to me from ASM, um, I worked on Biology Scholars Program where I met all these great people. Um, and it's really been um, sort of a transformative experience to move from someone who was trained as a microbiologist to be educator first. And what about the answer to the question about Abercrombs? Um, so the answer to the question is students definitely benefited from going. The actual experience of being with other scientists, they felt more connected to our institution and also as scientists, and more of them went on to graduate school. So I'm providing you with your students, Mark. Mm -hmm. I, I think that it's also true that instructors who go to Abercoms gain a lot too because you see a lot of ways different people think across the country and it really is true there's real power in diversity so it, it's a, a nice program that's run by the ASM for those of you who didn't know Abercoms is run by the ASM and one of the other things I'm going to just follow up since this is Jimby Live Jimby provides a great place for publishing education research and and tools and things that you learn to share them with the rest of the world. It, it sure does. And Jimby, one of the benefits of Jimby is you can start with an idea and it can be a tips and tools or a curriculum piece and then build on that to have a piece that then has assessment data and can be a research project. Um, and it's getting rarer over time that journals allow you to publish without necessarily hardcore results that are statistically analyzed. So Jimby is really uh, benefits faculty that way. But, but, but I think what you said is really true, is it, 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 build, it builds on this transition. So you can see something evolve from an idea that you think would have impact to really evidence of that impact. And I think that there's real value in stimulating people to think about things with that. So, and one of the other things you, maybe you'll mention is because it ties into what you just said, is that the 
the editors of Jim B really work to help you get your things published, to, to, to make sure that you understand the kind of analysis that needs to be done. And yeah, so with Jimby, I mean, definitely the bar has risen over the past year since I started on this work in 2005. However, we understand that a lot of people are still new to the field and the Jimby reviewers and editors take a lot of time and they write reviews that are supposed to help you improve your paper, make it more clear, and promote your work. So it's not just re rejecting your paper, it's, we're going to say it's not ready for public consumption just now, but we're going to help you make it ready. So, Mark, let's come back to you. You have really used a, a variety of objects, right? Of buttons, of 3D printed items, of you name it, you've used those to build student excitement and get them involved in experiments in a really different way. Could you comment on that? Oh, sure. I, I mean, the trick is uh, you need to be enthusiastic. You have to believe in what you're doing. And it's been said that I have an unfortunate excess of enthusiasm, and this is true. And I had steered into the skit, and I recommend that you do the same thing. Be who you are. And for me, it being Markish, as the saying goes, or Dockish, depending on if you're a student or not, it's okay. So I, I created this idea of, of bringing together artistic approaches from students. Many of the things that people see me hand out have actually been designed by students. And that gives them a sense of ownership and a feeling of community within um, the quality quorum, as I call my class. I also call my students micronauts, and we make buttons about that. I usually offer students the opportunity to do some kind of artistic approach within the classroom. The key to this is, is ownership. And they really feel like they, they're not memorizing three by five cards, they're learning from the process and they're able to apply it elsewhere. And uh, I assume those are Doc Martens that you have on your feet right now? <laughs> I have seven pair of Doc Martens because, uh, well, there's a whole story behind that I won't go into, but yes, I have seven pair. So, so uh, Nancy, you've done a lot with assessment over time, and then you have you, you had this experiment, this new course on one health and pandemics at, at prime time for thinking about a pandemic. Hey, uh, what was it that led to you thinking about starting a course like that, and and how did the students respond to it pre and post pandemic? Great question. Um, so when I first started the course, it was as an outreach as to why microbiology is important in everyday life. And again, this is fall 2019. So it, it, it did gather a few people. We had maybe 12 people the second semester. We had 50 people sign up for this course. So it's really, the, the pre and post, they were really interested in it and didn't know a lot of the things that we were talking about, how you can get diseases transferring from animal species into the human population and how these outbreaks occur in spillover events. And so they were very interested in fall 19. In fall 2020, we had students saying this was the most relevant course they took in their college career, and which, of course, I was ecstatic about. So... And this is students from all over campus. This, this was a non-majors class. It really was to fulfill credit requirements, and it was very much meant as a service course. And ever since uh, 2020, I've had at least 40 students every single semester that I've taught it. Have you published an assessment on it yet? Not yet. I'm getting there. I, I've got a backlog. I, I'll keep you in, bus in business and Jimby for a while. <laughs> Good. So, so... Dave, one of the things I always think about you doing is an amazing job teaching students from a lot of different disciplines, but also a tremendous amount of public outreach, right? Well, what drives the public outreach and, and, and how did you get into that? Yeah. Um, the public outreach side of my career path really, again, it's ASM. You know, I, I, my first ASM as a faculty member, um, I participated on uh, uh, teacher science days. And, and saw the need 
in the in the K twelve community for those opportunities, those connections, the, the the help with doing some of these things in the classroom. Um, and so that was just that realization, that awareness that came from from doing those programs through ASM. Um, and then, of course, once you get to know the teachers, you get to know the communities, and then it starts kind of growing from there, and you, you start to recognize, um, not so much a need, actually, but it's just a desire for people to just want to learn, to have that dialogue. So that's how it kind of came about. You played a key role in ASM's interaction with the USA Science and Engineering Festival, and you actually got people from the outside doing experiments at stand-up tables in the middle of a park. Why don't you tell us a couple of things you got them to do? Oh, the, the uh, uh, USA Science and Engineering Festival. We've done that so many years, and there's so many activities. Um, I remember that first year, uh, yeah, out in the tents underneath, out on the, on, on the mall, um, and doing things like looking at bioluminescent bacteria through, you know, set up a device so they could actually see it outdoors, to uh, see how to make a Winograski column, um, to, to answer questions about microbes that they weren't aware of. So it was just a lot of that, again, uh, that awareness, you know, kind of recruiting people as they wander by and say, have you ate the microbe today? And, and kind of get them to think about what's a microbe? Where is that the connection? So it's, it's just starting that dialogue is where it all begins. Now, Loretta, if you were to give advice to somebody coming through the system, let's say there's somebody who's gone through grad school and really loves microbiology but maybe does not like standing at the lab bench working all day, what, what would you talk to them about? Follow your passion. I'm hoping the passion's teaching. Uh, and start small and develop a project in your class, see what students think about it, and then look at it from the aspect of student learning and aligning your outcomes with your activities. Gather some data publish it, or attempt to publish it. And also, find like-minded people. They might not be on your campus, might be through your Center for Teaching and Learning, but go out there and find people like these sitting here today um, and work with them. The community is very open. They're willing to help you and bring in new people. So reach out to them and ask as many questions as you can. So just to follow up on that, I think that one of the things about the science education community, in particular the microbiology education community, is it's, it's not a sense of competition. It's a sense that we're all working together to, to be better and make life better for students and for the world, right? So I, I think that that's a key thing. It, it is a key thing. Um, unlike you know, the competition that normally science is entrenched in, it's not like this. It's this mindset that we want students to progress, we want students to become scientists, and the way to do that is developing excellence in teaching. Now, now Mark, you mentioned that one of the things you've been very successful at is getting students who come through your group to go off and go to graduate school. What's the magic sauce? So the, the, the trick is uh, the mentorship um, and working with them as individuals and finding, I mean, there's, there's a joke that students say that they enter my lab not being that interested in microbiology and then exit as microbiologists and I say guilty. Uh, and I don't do it directly, I just introduce them to questions and the trick is to give them ownership and organization and mentorship. They need their own project now, it's good to work together on things, and that is how science progresses, but they need to have that sense of something that's theirs, and they learn how to design a project and follow up on it, and there is absolutely no substitute for the first time that they find something out that nobody knew before. I didn't say it was important necessarily, but they found out, and I have so many wonderful memories of that, and those are all people that have gone on to earn P. I have five of my former students are tenured professors all over the country. I've sent my 25th research student to uh, a PhD program this year. And it's just because I, I think of that, that I'm a, I'm a talent scout. That's what I like to say. I, I, I think that what you said about the self-discovery, to me, that is the difference between a cookbook lab and genuine experiential learning. Can I, can I follow up on Absolutely. that for a second? I, I had a student who came to, to my lab as before classes had started in her first year. 
and she said she really wanted to do microbiology, but she knew nothing about it. So I talked a little bit about evolution in action, and what I, I used is soft auger to allow, you could take a single colony and then you stab it with a toothpick and they swim out in soft auger. And I had her take a sample from the leading edge and the center onto separate plates and do this through 20 cycles. And then what she found out is that the ones that she took just from the center repeatedly swam very slowly, even under the microscope. And the ones at the edge were hypermodal and hyperactive. And I said, you've heard of natural selection. This was Emily's selection. And you did this. You found this out. And she had to know nothing. She knew, had to know nothing about microbiology to make this happen. And it hooked her. And she's in a tropical medicine program now. So, so Nancy, could, could you give some insight? You've done a lot of stuff with analysis. And how do how? What's the best way for people to learn how to do that? Because it's a real special skill. I think a lot of people going into education research think, oh, the analysis will be straightforward. And it, it never is. Uh, you're, you're right on it's never uh, as straightforward as it might look. Um, very similar to when you do a bench experiment, you don't know what you don't know when you're starting. And so one of the biggest recommendations if you're just starting on this is set it up as a research question, as if you would in a bench experiment with a hypothesis, with a research question, and then go across the, the campus or across the hallway, depending on where you're, you're housed, and talk to some of the social scientists and the education department and the statistics department and see what they think of your experimental design because a lot of times they will have really good suggestions, especially as you're starting out, because they may think of things in a very different way than we do as microbiologists. Um, I have a couple of statistics colleagues that I rely on a lot because they, they think of things in a very different way than I would as uh, an education researcher, and sometimes they catch things that you just wouldn't have noticed. So building that community both within your university and as well as across the country. I think um, ASM Biology Scholars, ASM Tools that we have, Jimby, the, the editors do an amazing job of helping uh, work through some of these things. So if you submit a paper to Jimby and it doesn't, it doesn't have the right experimental design, they're not going to say, how dare you not have the right experimental design. They'll make actual constructive suggestions and maybe shift the publication a little bit from maybe a research to a tips and tools. So it, I, it, I've had a very positive experience with the whole thing over the years. Could you say something about human subjects approval too? Because oh, that's key. Oh, yes. Um, that's actually the first thing you need to do before you start gathering data because there's a line between assessment you do for your classroom and that's what you do for yourself and to see how you're improving your class. But if you want to share that data, you need institutional review board approval, and which means before you start gathering data, you need to have your, your plans laid out and submit them to your IRB folks because they need to know what you're doing before you start sharing data about the students at your university. I think this is really key, and it's really a sad situation when you see somebody who's done some nice work but they didn't get the approval. So it really is a difficult situation to be in. I don't envy you as the editor, Jimmy. <laughs> oh. So Dave, um, you ha you've had a very different path. Than everyone here has had a really different path. So if you were gonna give advice to somebody c coming up, going, let's say going through a graduate program at UCLA and and maybe wanting to, to move on to think of, about education research as their focus, what would you tell them? Well, the first thing, in, in, in microbiology, again, reach out to ASM because of all the great programs we have. I mean, that, that, that's, that's where all the help is. You know, going to a conference like ASMQ, our conference for undergraduate educators, is such a powerful community to be connected with. And, and that's what really, again, helped me do it. So, so, again, kind of make those connections, find your colleagues, um, find the questions that are interesting to you, just like your bench work. You know, your, your education research is the same as your bench research. Um, when I started Biology Scholars, I feel sorry for my poor mentor. You know, hours on the phone, 
trying to trying to formulate my question in the right way that it was a testable hypothesis. Um, you know, you have to relearn that again in education. So so don't be afraid to try things out. One of the things I'm surprised that none of you have mentioned is serving as a TA and how that might have influenced you on the pathway. My my TAs influenced me. You know, my TAs okay. said. I don't do it that right. way. But I mean on your personal journey. Yeah. That was so long ago and it was in chemistry. <laughs> <laughs> but Stanley, I think being a TA, that's when that love for teaching started. I knew, I knew then that although I loved the research I did and it was exciting and we went diving in the Caribbean and collected samples. There was just something about being in the classroom with students and I knew I wanted to teach undergraduates um, and forever I'm gonna be at a community college. I know that. <laughs> oh yeah, well when, when I TA'd in graduate school and, and I was, it was an, an, a set of open labs and so I had these, these students who were very self-possessed, very sure of themselves, very interactive. And we were able to talk back and forth. And I learned I could really negotiate that. Um, you know, I was, what, two years older than they were, right? But the interesting part is, is that I was able to help them formulate questions. And I found that very gratifying. And again, to see the look on their faces when they get something. And again, those labs that I was a TA for, they, they were kind of open-ended long before there were cures. Uh, and, and it was really transformative to me. I, I had a similar experience. I, I was actually an undergraduate in a class that was the worst lecture I ever had in all of my education, but in the lab, a magician, <laughs> a very, a Marco Martin, right? <laughs> um, who could get you so excited about anything you found on your plate, right? And then later I had the opportunity some years later, of TAing for that same person. And it was an amazing experience. And it, it convinced me that this is what I, you know, I want to always be a teacher. And I've done a lot of other things, but I've always been a teacher. I found it, as, as a TA, again, now we were doing mostly cookbook labs at, at UCLA where I was. It was very much a cookbook lab situation. My passion for teaching came from working with undergraduate research, mentoring undergraduates as a graduate student, as a postdoc. Um, and then when I started teaching my own lab, I realized this cookbook stuff is, is for the birds. You know, we need, how do I simulate that same situation when I was training undergraduates? And so how do I convert my microbiology lab into a mentoring situation, not a, not a skills training situation? Well, this has been a great conversation. I want, I want to do a couple things just to tie us up. One is there was a plug for ASMQ. ASMQ is the Conference for Undergraduate Educators, a great place to build these networks that everyone here has said is so important. July 13th through 15th, it's going to be online this year, and it, a really great experience. High, I think all of us highly recommend that as an opportunity. So. Please take advantage of it. it. It's not only a variety of great educators, but it's great educators from around the world. So you experience some things that may be outside of your local network, and, and it's really very valuable. We've also had some plugs for Jimby. I'm the editor-in-chief of Jimby. I couldn't go away without a plug. Please send your papers to Jimby. Jimby has the greatest editors in the world and will help you make sure the research that you do has the biggest impact beyond your students to students all over the rest of the world. And I think that it, it's always so much fun to sit around a group of people who have such a variety of different approaches to education, but first and foremost, they really care about teaching effectively and with impact. So thank you all for everything you do. I know why you were selected as Karski Awardees. So thanks very much. And thanks so much to the audience today. And we hope all of you listening online, give us feedback later. We'd love to hear from you.